Let's go ahead and get into it. As always, this content is going to be for educational purposes only. All examples and analysis are intended for these purposes and should not be considered as specific investment or trading advice. Any hypothetical examples are for the purposes of teaching principles, and they're not intended to suggest any future results. The risk of loss in trading securities, such as equities, options, futures, and forex, can be substantial. So you guys have to consider all relevant risk factors, including your own personal financial situation before trading. Options, futures, and forex are considered more sophisticated investment vehicles due to higher leverage, and they're not suitable for everybody. Any results that I share today should not be considered typical. All righty. Now that the lawyers are happy, let's keep going. Welcome back. We are on day three of your options trading journey out of four. So we had, uh, let's see, first day was our introduction where we talked about all the different building blocks. We had a discussion about um, variance, and then we ended with the options chain, which was nice. Yesterday, we talked all about option pricing. It's kind of hard to type with a, a mouse. <laughs> So we talked everything about uh, being in the money, being out of the money, what the option Greeks were, all the things that go into option pricing. And then we ended with a discussion about volatility because volatility is very important when it comes to options trading. And it's one of those things that we don't really have to worry about with stock trading. Like the extent that we use it in stock trading is kind of just looking at things like our average true range and just being like, okay, so this stock moves more than average or less than average. So I have to hold it longer if it moves less than average, or I'll hold it uh, for a shorter period of time if it has higher volatility. And that's about it, right? Whereas with options, volatility very much is directly tied to the price of our options, the value of those options. So we have to understand how volatility works and where and when we should be buying and selling volatility. Now we're going to kind of wrap up everything that we've been talking about, and we're going to combine it all into our first strategy here. And we're actually going to cover two strategies today, and that will be your first steps into buying options. Okay, so we are talking all about the what, the when, the why, and the how to buy options. We're going to cover our first two strategies, which is our long call strategy and our protective put strategy. Then after this, of course, we've got a VIP session for all of you special VIPers. And for you, we're going to be talking about how to make money with options when things go down, as well as an open Q&A for everyone. All right. So don't forget, there's a VIP session only, VIP only session after this. Now, everyone here, if you are VIP, and I'll say this again near the end of the class, um, check your emails. Again, we had kind of a Zoom snafu. So um, check your emails. Rebecca sent all of the VIPs another email. So the email that you used to register for this class, make sure you check that email again, and you'll have a link from Rebecca for the VIP session tonight. So please make sure you click that in order to get into our VIP session. Okay, cool. So again, as a quick reminder, going over this every day so that we understand where we're going. You used to be unconsciously incompetent about options. You didn't know that options existed. Then somewhere along the way, you found out about options. And at some point you took the webinar, probably last week, where I was talking about how cool options are. And that got you to the stage of conscious incompetence, where you now knew that there were things that you didn't know about. Now we are working on your conscious competence. Now you know how option pricing works. You kind of have a, a rough idea of how options are structured and all of that, you know where to go to buy and sell options. And now we're going to get you to the point where you are ready to take your very first options trade, a long call strategy. Or if you own some stocks, you can buy some protection for those stocks. And lastly, the last step then in your trading journey is to get to the unconscious competence stage, which again is not something I can get you to. That's somewhere you can only get to through your own practice and repetition, because that is the stage where you are competent at something and it's unconscious, meaning that it's not something that you have to think about. Okay, what was the strike I need to buy? How far away for the expiration date does that need to be? All of those things just come naturally to you. You don't have to think about it. It just becomes second nature and you are kind of on autopilot when you're doing these things. Of course, you still have your analysis and all of that, but when it comes to choosing the right options, it's not something that is a struggle for you anymore. And again, that only comes through practice. I can't get you there. So the boot camp, we're getting you to the conscious competence stage. And the unconscious competence is the last step that you have to take yourself. Okay, so our itinerary tonight. We are learning our first two option strategies. So we will cover the benefits and risks of buying a call option. So the pros and the cons of that. We'll talk about how to structure a long call trade. 
We'll also talk about how to read a risk graph. So I talked about this a little bit in the webinars that we were in. So some of you might be a little familiar with risk graphs. Some of you, this might be brand new. So we'll talk about how to read a risk graph because they're very helpful for visually understanding how options work. So it's quite useful. We'll also talk about how to protect your stocks with options. That'll be the second strategy that we looked at, the protective put tonight. Okay, so diving right in. Buying options. We're going to use an analogy. So meet Anna. Anna is house hunting. Now, let's say that she finds a great deal for $400,000 for a house in her area. Now, she can't close on the deal right now, but she wants to lock in a great price. So what does she do? Anna purchases the right to buy the house. So she gives the seller, let's say $2,000 now, and in exchange for this down payment, the seller or this premium that Anna pays him, in exchange for that, the seller agrees to sell Anna the house for $400,000 anytime in the next three months. So what happens then in this scenario if Anna decides not to buy the house? Maybe she can't get the financing together or she finds a better deal or whatever the case may be. For some reason or another, she decides, you know what, ultimately, I don't want the house. Well, what does she lose in that scenario? Who can tell me? We'll do a little quiz here. Donnell coming in hot this morning. Yep. So she loses her two grand, right? She loses her uh, her premium. Exactly. Guatam's on top of it with the uh, the terminology, vocabulary. There we go. All right. So she loses the $2,000, right? Well, what happens if she does want to buy the house and the appraisal comes in at $500,000, which I understand, not a super realistic scenario, but let's just pretend the seller is underpricing the house and it's actually worth $500,000. Well, in that scenario, I mean, she would definitely want to buy it for $400,000, right? So she gets built-in equity if she can buy it for $400,000. So in that scenario, what has Anna done? She's purchased an option contract, right? And it's an option contract on a different asset class, but we know that the right to buy an underlying asset for a certain price before a certain amount of time is an option contract. So remember, the holder of the option contract has the right, but not the obligation. Anna doesn't have to buy the house, but she can if she wants to. She has the right to buy or sell an asset, in this case, a house, for a certain price, in this case, $400,000, before the option expires. And in this example, it was for three months. In our example, Anna purchased the right to buy the house for $400,000 within three months. Now, option contracts work the same way in the financial world too, right? Just like in this housing example, they work in the stock market the same way. So we're going to learn by example. Let's say that you're bullish on Micron. Micron, a bit of an older example of here, but it came up here, came down, and we basically found support here around 76. And during this time, it's basically just been bouncing back and forth between 76 and about 85, right? Come up to resistance, come back down to support, come up to resistance, come back down to support, and now we're bouncing up off of support. So let's say you go, okay, well, this seems like a decent trade to take. You're just looking for a move up to resistance again, and we'll just play the uh, the up and down swings here until Micron decides to break this channel. So as long as it's trading up and down here, we're going to be bullish on Micron up to resistance. So let's say that you buy the 80 strike call option. So you can see that's a little bit above where the stock is currently trading. So this is your, your call option strike here. So by doing that, you are reserving the right to buy Micron for $80 per share, right? That's basically your, your line in the sand there. As long as Micron's above 80, then you'll have intrinsic value on that option, right? It will be in the money. Cool. So if Micron goes up to 84 or you know maybe all the way up to resistance at 85 there, you still have the right to purchase shares for 80. So if you thought that Micron could get to 84 sometime in the next few weeks, how much would you pay for the right to buy Micron at 80? How much would that be worth? Right, so Donnell says four, right? And I think that makes sense. So we know that that contract should be worth at least $4 because you have at least $4 of built-in equity if, option, or if Micron is trading at four and your option gives you the right to buy at 80. So... How this transaction works is the option buyer has money, the option seller has the contract. So the buyer, you, give money to the seller. So the seller receives the money, and in return, the option buyer receives the contract. So sometimes, we talked about this in VIP to give you guys a little bit of a sneak peek, those of you that are not in VIP, the option seller is sometimes called the option writer. 
So selling to open an option contract is sometimes called writing an option. And so really the option seller is the one who originates the contract and then the contract gets traded to the buyer in exchange for cash. Now, all of this happens instantly behind the scenes with the click of a button, just like when you buy stocks, you know, technically those are shares of companies and you're trading cash to usually the market maker or your broker who has the shares or they find someone else in the market who has the shares and then, you know, your money goes to them and their shares go to you. Again, it all happens behind the scenes automatically with the click of a button. So it's not like you have to, you know, know how to write a contract yourself or anything. You just click the sell button in the uh, in the broker contract. But I think it's good to understand kind of the mechanics behind what's happening. The important things here is that the seller receives cash for their contract. And we're going to look at that tomorrow being on this side of the transaction. But today, you are the option buyer. So you are giving cash to the seller. And in exchange, you're receiving the contract. So now you have some rights. The seller who sold you the contract has some obligations and you've given money for that contract. So you receive the contract in this example, a call option. The seller receives cash from you. So you're paying for the contract. So who has what at the end of this transaction? Well, the option buyer has bought a contract. The option seller has sold a contract, right? So you have bought a contract on the other side of the transaction. Someone sold that contract to you. So you as the buyer have rights within that contract, whereas the seller has obligations. If you choose to exercise your right, right, if Anna decided she did want to buy the house, well, then the seller is obligated to sell her that house for $400,000. Whether he wants to or not, he promised her that she would, and it's a legally binding contract. So for that right, Anna has paid money. In our example, she paid $2,000 for the right to buy the house. In exchange, Josh received that $2,000, so he has money in exchange for making promises on that asset. So let's say that, going back to the Micron example here, let's say that you paid $3 per share for the right to buy Micron at $80 per share. Okay, so 80 is our strike price in the example, right? That's the right, or the, the price at which we have the right to buy Micron. And what cost us, or what that contract cost us is $3 per share, right? So a lot of times these things confuse people, the difference between the price of the contract and the strike price. Remember, the strike price is where you can buy the shares at, right? So that's like locking in the house price for $400,000. The um, the price of the contract is what you pay for that right. So in Anna's example, it was $2,000 for the house. In our example with Micron here, we're saying that that contract uh, is costing us $3 per share. So I hope that's clear to everyone. So what is the most that you could lose if you paid $3 per share on this option contract to buy Micron at $80 per share? Craig's on top. So $3 per share. Some of you were saying $300, and that's also correct. It's $3 per share or $300 per contract because each contract is 100 shares, represents 100 shares. So if you said three or 300, you're both correct. So on one contract, it would be $300 total minimum. Uh, and then if you just did it on a per share basis, it would be $3 per share. You're both correct. So $3 per share is the most that you can lose on this contract. So again, it's important to understand here, you guys are already on top of it, but one option contract controls 100 shares of stock like we've talked about. So this makes it easy to compare buying one option contract to buying 100 shares of stock because it's basically controlling the same thing. So if we look at these side by side, we can compare what it would be like to buy a stock compared to buying an option. So on the stock, we would end up buying 100 shares for $80 per share, which would cost us $8,000. That means our max risk is $8,000. Of course, we have stop losses and all those sorts of things. But ultimately, we have to put up eight hundred or eight thousand dollars out of our account in order to take this trade. Things like margin, notwithstanding, but um, you know, so you have eight thousand dollars of risk on this trade. Whereas if we did this with an option, well, we have one contract which represents the same one hundred shares that we have over here, but this only costs us three dollars per share. So ultimately, we get into this trade for much much less capital, and it also means that no matter what our risk is completely capped at $300. So there's no way that we can lose more than $300, even if the stock gaps against us. So what if we're right and Micron goes up to 84, kind of near our resistance level up there? 
Well, in that example, let's look at the returns here. So if we had bought stock, we'd be able to sell our $80 stock for 84. And if we had 100 shares of that, that would be $8,400 uh, that we bring in when we sell the stock. Minus the $8,000 that we spent to buy that stock leaves us with a $400 profit. So a $400 profit on an $8,000 investment gives us a 5% return. Not terrible when you're trading stocks, but of course, with options, we can do much better. So with options, the same $4 move in the stock is still going to make our option worth at least $400 at expiration. So remember, we have the right to buy at 80. If the stock is trading at 84, then that means that at expiration, when there's no time value left, we have 84, sorry, we have $4 of intrinsic value left in our contract. Remember from option pricing yesterday, the way intrinsic value works, our option would be $4 in the money, right? Because we are able to buy the stock for $4 less than it's currently trading in the market. So we have $4 of intrinsic value, meaning our contract is $4 in the money. So it's going to be worth at least $400 or at expiration, it's going to be worth exactly $400 when there's no more time value remaining. We have only intrinsic value left. So there's $4 of intrinsic value times the 100 shares per contract leaves us with $400 of value in our option contract. We paid 300 for that contract, which leaves us with a $100 profit, which yes, the dollar amount is less than the stock here, but our return is much higher. So if we want to get the same dollar amount, we can just trade more contracts, right? So if I wanted to get the same dollar amount here that uh, I would get on the option contracts, I could just trade four more contracts, right? Rather than spending 300 bucks, I'd spend 1200 bucks, which is still much better than the 8,000 here. And it would still be a 33% return, which still blows the stock trade out of the water. Okay, so let's get back to the chart here. So we agree as we said before, that being able to buy Micron at 80 is worth at least $4 when Micron's trading at 84, right? So if Micron went up to 84, our $80 contract would be worth at least $4. And the reason for that is because we could exercise our right to buy the shares at 80 and then immediately turn around and sell them in the market for 84 because they're trading in the market for 84, which would net you an instant $4 profit. So necessarily the contract has to be worth at least $4 per share plus any time value remaining. So if Micron went all the way up to 90, for example, how much would it be worth to have the right to buy at 80? Just make sure we're all awake and paying attention here. All right, Mike's awake at least. <laughs> yeah, so if, uh, if we can buy at 80 and Micron comes all the way up here and starts trading at 90, well, then this contract is going to be worth at least $10 per share. So the higher Micron goes, right, if it was worth $4 per share at 84 and it's worth $10 per share at 90, we're starting to build a pattern here, right? The higher Micron goes, the more valuable the right to buy at 80 becomes, right? So just like a stock, our call option can go up in value forever. There's no limit to how much that call option could become worth, right? The higher Micron goes, as we saw, the more that contract is worth, and there's no theoretical limit to that. So the higher we get, the more value we have in our contract. But what about the downside, right? What happens if Micron were to go down? What is our risk in that scenario? Well, just like we talked about, when you buy a stock, you can lose as much as you paid for that stock. So in this case, it would have been $80 per share is the total amount of risk we would have. And that's true for options too. Your risk is what you paid for the option. But of course, options cost a whole lot less than stock, so it ends up being much more beneficial. So in this example, the 80 strike call option costs us $3 per share. This means that the most that we could lose on this stock is $3 per share, no matter what the stock does. So for us, that drops us down to 77 down here from 80 down to 77. And you'll notice that that's basically right around where we have support on the stock anyways. So if the stock were to come down here and break below support and keep going down, well, our option contract basically has a built-in stop loss here at our support level. And if we were to break below that, we wouldn't lose any more. So that's pretty great. By buying a call option, you still get to participate in the infinite upside that comes with stocks. Again, stocks don't go to infinity, but the higher they go, the more money you can make with your options. 
But at the same time, you end up limiting your risk to only a fraction of what you could lose on a stock trade, right? If some bad news comes out about Micron, I don't know, this CEO dies in a horrible car accident or something, right? And the the stock price plummets down here to $70 per share, just opens up at 70 the next day because of some really bad news that happened. Well, if you are trading stocks, you're just instantly down $10 per share and there's nothing you can do about it. Stop loss doesn't save you from that like we, we talked about. Whereas with an option contract, you're still only risking the $3 per share. You can't lose more than that $3 per share. How did we set the bottom price to 78? It's actually 77. This maybe isn't the best box here. Let me drag that down a little. Okay, there we go. A little bit more accurate here. Um, it's not that the price was 78. The thing is that we bought an 80 strike contract, right? And we paid $3 per share for that. So that leaves us where we would end up taking a max loss on this trade if the trade was below 80 or basically down to 77, right? So the $3 that we paid for the contract minus the 80 of our strike price, 77 is kind of like the, that's where we would hit zero on this contract before expiration or close to it. And um, yeah, that's pretty much right where we have support here on the stock. So it's not necessarily that it's a bottom price. It's just kind of getting you to visualize how far away the price of that option is from our strike price here. So 77 is the $3 away that we paid for that contract. Okay, let's see. So if we were very right and Micron went up to 90 by expiration, the calls would be worth $10 per share, right? Which would be a 233% return. Oops, I skipped this first one. If it went up to 84, of course, you know, around our resistance level here, they'd be worth $4 per share, which we said was, didn't we say it was a 33% return? Yeah, it's not a 25% return, it's a 33% return. What's wrong with me? Math is hard. Okay, there we go. Should be a 33% return. And if Micron goes up to 90 by expiration, the shares should be worth $10 per share, which should be a 233% return. Now I want to double check my math on everything. <laughs> so we had a $10 return minus our $3 of investment divided by our $3. Yeah, 233%. Excellent. Just making sure. Okay. But let's look at the flip side here now. And this is an important concept to pay attention to. This leads us to the concept of a break-even price, which we kind of don't really have with stocks, but kind of. Okay, so let's say Micron is at $81 at expiration. So it's above 80, right? It's here at 80, or it's here at 81. We have the right to buy at 80, and now Micron's up here at 81. The calls are worth $1 per share right? Because we have the right to buy at 80. They're trading at 81, which gives us $1 of intrinsic value. So the, the options are worth $1 per share, but we paid $3 for them. So the thing that we paid three for is now only worth one, which means we actually lost $2 per share. So the stock went up, but it didn't go up enough, okay? So this leads us to the concept of a break-even price. And so... Maybe those of you that have done options trading before can tell me. And if you haven't, take a guess. What price does Micron need to be at for me to break even on my calls or for you to break even on your calls in this scenario? Craig's on top of it. Your strike plus your premium is correct. So you pay 80 or your strike is 80 and you paid $3 for that, which means you will break even at expiration at 83. Now, before expiration, because you have time value left over, you can still make money anywhere above 80, but you are fighting against time decay every day that goes by. So ideally, we minimize time decay by buying more time than we need, but in the uh, just looking at expiration here so we can subtract out the effects of time value and just look at the intrinsic value side of things. At expiration, you have an 80 strike option that you paid $3 for, Micron needs to be above 83 for you to turn a profit on that. So another way to understand this relationship is via a risk graph. So a risk graph, also called a profit, or what's it called? Don't remember the other name. 
Um, it shows the potential profit and loss of the position at different prices. So this is the risk graph of a long stock. It's very simple. It's just a straight diagonal line that never changes, right? It goes from bottom left to top right. It's pretty simple. And all we're seeing here, let's say our, our stock price is exactly here, at least our, uh, our entry price is right here. And that's right at the zero line, right? So the way that you read a risk graph is it's kind of like a stock chart, except when we look at a stock chart, right, we've got our time across the x-axis here, and we've got our stock price across the y-axis. So the stock is going up and down over time, right? And hopefully it goes more up and than down, or if we're short, we hope it goes down more than up, I guess. But, um, you know, you have time across the bottom, and then you have the dollar amount of the stock, and as time goes forward, the stock goes up and down in value, right? Well, with a risk graph, we kind of take that and we like turn it on its head a little bit. So we just rotate it over a little bit. And the stock price is actually across the x-axis here on a risk graph. So this is the stock price. So this is, let's say, the, the price of the stock today. As we go to the right, this is the stock price increasing in value. Okay. So as the stock price goes up, we move to the right on the chart. And as the stock price goes down, we're moving to the left on the chart. Okay. And then what we have on the y-axis, instead of time now, on the y-axis, we have our profit and loss in our position. So the risk graph shows you the PL of a position that you have. So yeah, profit diagram, that's probably what I'm thinking of. For some reason that didn't sound right though. Yes, risk graph is definitely available in Thinkorswim. I can show you in just a second. So what we have here is we have our zero line, and this is our break-even point. This is where we break even on our trade is when our uh, our line here, this big thick black line, when that crosses over zero, that's the point where we haven't made or lost any money. And on a stock graph, that's either right where the stock is trading right now, if we don't have a position yet, or when we have a position, it's where our entry point is, right? So if we paid $100 per share for the stock, then my zero line is when the stock is at uh, $100 per share, right? I haven't made or lost any money from that point. As we go to the right, as the stock price goes up, we also get more profits in here, right? So my line goes up above zero here. Whereas when we go to the left, as the stock price goes down, that's where losses occur, right? I'm losing money as the stock goes down below my break-even point, right? Where I bought in. Cool. So for every $1 that the stock goes up, the PNL of a long stock position goes up $1 per share, right? It's a one-to-one -one relationship because you have the shares and if the shares go up a dollar, your shares go up a dollar, right? Pretty straightforward, which also means coincidentally that shares have a delta of one. For those of you that uh, remember delta from yesterday, that's our rate of change of our option price. Well, if you look at the rate of change of a stock share, right? Stock shares have a delta of one, which might seem kind of like, well, duh, Chris, they go up a dollar for every dollar the stock moves, right? Of course. But this actually has some important implications later when we get to things like delta hedging, which again is too far outside of the concept of um, the boot camp that we're doing this week. But delta hedging is something that we can do to protect our options positions by actually trading the underlying stock and making our delta on our option position down to zero by counteracting, like if we have positive delta in our options, we can short sell shares to counteract our positive delta in our options and become delta neutral, which is something that sometimes we like to do. Now, the profits on a long stock here are potentially unlimited. So if you were to drag this chart to the right, or if you could see further to the right, the arrow here on the end represents that this line just keeps going up and up and up to the right forever and ever and ever. Amen because there's no limit to how high the stock price could go. It is limited to the downside only by the stock going to zero, right? So if the stock price goes all the way down to zero, then that is the most money that we can lose on our stock. So you guys already know this stuff. You know the mechanics of you know buying a stock and uh, how you make money and lose money from that. But I want to explain it to you graphically using something that you already know to introduce the risk graph, right? So now we can move on from the risk graph of a long stock to the risk graph of a long call option. You'll notice it's a little bit different. So just like with stocks, though, our profit is potentially unlimited on our, uh, our risk graph of our long call option here, right? This keeps going on forever and ever as long as the stock price keeps going up. But to the downside, when we're wrong, if the stock price does not go up and it keeps going down, well, here our losses are limited 
by what we paid for the option. So this is our, our premium here. Whatever we paid for the option in our Micron example, this was $3 per share. So that's the most that we can lose on this trade would be $3 per share times 100 shares per contract times however many contracts we traded. So our profits are still unlimited and our losses are limited to the price of the option no matter how far down the stock goes. So on the stock graph, we had this line just keep going down and down until we hit zero. But on our options, we have a cutoff here. And that's what leads to this like elbow here where it bends, right? We have this, this pivot point where we stop losing money and it just levels out at that point. Cool. Now, the other thing that you'll notice as well is on our long stock, remember that assuming we bought this at the current price, our break-even point is whatever the current stock price is, which is whatever we paid for the stock, right? That's our break-even point. But on an option, notice that if we just bought the stock right now, the break-even point is further away here, right? It's the same distance as our premium here, right? So if this is a $3 gap down here, then this distance to my break-even point is $3 away, okay? So I have the stock has to move up more than $3 for me to start making a profit on this at expiration. Now, before expiration, I can make profit on it earlier. It doesn't have to get above 83. But to keep the math simple, because again, time value can be pretty complicated to calculate when you're like between the start date and your expiration. Somewhere in between there, it's kind of hard to figure out how much time value is going to be remaining without some computer models. So uh, we gen we generally tend to just look at the price of options at expiration to keep the math simple. And anything before that is just going to be better. So that's nice. We can just get better returns. All right. So when you're bullish on a stock with a lot of potential upside, buying a call option can be a great way to make money. You'll generally get better returns than you would buying stocks for way less capital. You get that same potentially unlimited leveraged upside, right? So if the stock moves up a lot, you have a ton of money that you can make on call options. Plus you have limited downsides. So when you're wrong, you have that built-in stop loss. You can't lose more than you paid for the option. In this example, $3 per share. It's the most you could lose, right? And all of this comes at a fraction of the cost of owning the same number of shares, right? Now, sometimes they go really crazy. This was a trade that I had um, at the beginning of last year, or I guess the end of 2020, but I closed at the beginning of, no, wow. Yeah, 2021. Wow, this trade example is getting old. So this was um, a trade at the end of 2020. I bought some six-month call options in AMC of all trades for a dollar and two cents is how much they were trading for. Now, in less than a month, so I, I bought these expecting it to take a few months to get there. Um, and in less than one month, the stock had skyrocketed and the call options went from being worth a dollar to being worth almost $14, right? I closed them out for $13.96. Now, that's a 1,268% return. And this was not, I didn't take this trade because of Reddit. I was in this trade already. And then the GameStop thing happened. And then AMC was also being pumped by Reddit. So I did catch that. However, I feel like I need to defend myself when I use this example. <laughs> so we're going to go back in time here. We're going to take an adventure here. We're going to go back. I need more time on this. Yeah, five years. Okay. So let's go back and I'll show you guys why I took this trade and why it was not anything to do with Reddit. So this is the huge spike that happened, okay? And I was looking at this trade at the end of 2020. So looking back in 2020, in March of 2020, when we had the COVID crash, AMC came all the way down here to $2 per share, okay? That's what this is down here, $2 per share. And throughout 2020, they rebounded like everything else, came back down, came up, came back down and tested $2 per share again. Then, come on. Do, 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 do. Let's get that out of the way there. Okay. Then in December, they came back down here to $2 per share. And I was like, okay, it didn't get below $2 per share. Even at the lowest depths of the COVID crash here, we still never got below $2 per share, even though we tested it like three times and we tested it again uh, a month ago, we still never got below $2 per share. So for me, I'm looking at this going like, okay, well, given its recent history, $2 per share is a pretty good buy price on this. And even if I'm wrong, I mean, what's the most I can lose on this, right? Um, sure, I could have bought shares for two bucks, but I could buy options for one buck. So I got them basically half price here. 
to take a bet on AMC. And all I was looking for was a move up to maybe five or six dollars per share over the next six months. Because looking at uh, AMC here, right, we had dipped down to two. And over the next few months, we kind of made our way up to five, all the way up to seven. I wasn't really betting on, you know, back to the highs that we had had over the year. But I was thinking, you know, we'd probably have a move back up, definitely probably to four and maybe all the way up to six. So I just bought some six month call options being like, you know what? Cool. Let's buy. So I was buying like here when we came down to two. I was looking at this going, OK, seems like a good buying opportunity just to look for a quick move up to four or six and basically look to make, you know, a 300, 400 percent trade should be great. And then, you know, in January, that's when the whole um, GameStop thing happened. And so I woke up this day and the options were trading or the stock was somewhere around here. It was like $15 per share or something like that. Or maybe it was like $13 per share. And so when you wake up the next day and your options are up 1200%, just take the money and run. I didn't need to hold on to this to wait to see if it would go any further. I certainly didn't top tick this and like hold on to it to $20 per share. But yeah, when you wake up and your your options up 1200%, just just close it. Just take the money. <laughs> so this was, again, I didn't take this trade because of Reddit, but it did go up a lot because of Reddit. But I still think it was a good trade because it was based on the technicals on the stock, buying in at support and basically looking for a move up to that five or six dollar mark. So I still would have taken the trade regardless. It happened to work out crazily because of Reddit. But that's the thing. When you buy just call options and you're not limiting your, your opportunity, you don't know when like a short squeeze is going to happen or, you know, Reddit decides to pick a stock and pump it, right? We don't control when that happens. So by leaving your upside unlimited, this is kind of just an example of what can happen. Again, I'm not going to pretend like this is a typical trade. These are few and far between. I think this is my record, actually, 1,268%, uh, I think is the most I've made on a single option trade. So that was a nice, it was a nice trade for sure. But, you know, it certainly doesn't happen all the time. However, there have been some pretty great trades over the last few years as volatility has gotten really big and Reddit squeezes stuff and we have short squeezes all over the place. These are, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to pretend it wasn't lucky. It was definitely lucky, but I would have taken the trade anyways, right? I didn't take the trade because Reddit was talking about it and I was hoping to get lucky. I took the trade based on a solid trade setup and then I got lucky that it happened to be a stock that Reddit decided to pump. So it went up way more than it should have. But I still believe in those six months, it probably would have gotten up to four or five, six dollars per share anyways, because that's just how it was normally trading in 2020. So yeah, again, not a typical trade. But the point here is like when you leave that potential, um, when you have that unlimited upside potential, it it opens the door for things like this, which again, I didn't know Reddit was going to pump it in January, but we take those right when that happens. So generally speaking, um, if I'm going to take a long options trade, I generally don't like to take these types of trades unless I expect to make at least one to 200% on my money. So the Micron example where we are expecting to make 33%, I really probably wouldn't take that trade in reality. It's not enough for the risk that I'm taking. Like risking $3 to make $4 is not a good enough payoff for me for options because you have that time value and all of that. So, um, it, it's a good example to understand how the mechanics work, but realistically, I want a better return on my money here. So just to be aware, generally speaking, I look for 100 to 200% if I'm just going to be buying options because I want um, I need a big, strong move in the stock to overcome my, uh, my break-even price and to overcome the effects of time decay on that option. Now, I can minimize time decay by buying options that don't expire for a while. Like on AMC, I bought six months worth of time. I didn't think it was going to take six months to get there, but using the principles that we talked about yesterday, I buy more time than I need, right? So when I sold those options, they still had five months left on them, which means I got back five months of time value when I sold them, right? Plus all the crazy intrinsic value. But that's the point is that like I didn't lose much time value on those options while I was waiting for the stock to move because again I was in you know if this is my time decay graph where this is six months away and this is month zero well at the end of month one I've only lost a little bit of time value here right whereas I still have most of the time value remaining and when I sell I get all of this back cool so let's go like step by step through the process that I use to buy options 
So how to buy a call option. Step number one, you must be bullish on the stock. Okay, If you aren't sure, if you're neutral on the stock, you're like, oh, it's just kind of trading around in a range. Or if for some reason you don't think the stock is going to go up, if you're bearish on it, do not buy a call option. Okay, So buying a call option is only for when you are bullish on the stock. This is like the most important thing. If you buy call options, when you think a stock is going to go down, you're just going to lose money. <laughs> so unless you're wrong, which, you know, then there's something wrong with your analysis. So first of all, do your analysis and be bullish on the stock, okay? Don't buy a call option if you're not bullish on the stock. You have to think it's going to go up and have a good reason for that. Also, have a price target, okay? Price target is a must when you are buying options because you need to have an expectation for how much you are expecting to win on this trade, and that must be more than you are paying for the option, okay? You have to expect to have uh, a decent return on the option. So determine the length of your trade and then buy an option that expires after that. So if you expect to be in the trade for, let's say, two weeks, if it's a bit of a swing trade here, then buy a contract that expires in more than two weeks. So for example, a four-week contract or a six-week contract, right? Something like that. If you're a day trader and you are just going to be in and out in maybe a few hours or sometime today, I would still buy an option that doesn't expire today. Buy an option that expires you know, on Friday or buy one that expires next week. Yes, you will pay more for that. Yes, it's worth it. You will get most of that money back when you sell it. The point is that you don't lose the time value while you're in the trade, right? You want to minimize the effects of time decay as much as possible. Then the next thing you have to do is decide your strike price. So in the money, strikes are going to be safer. Um, they will have lower returns. However, I will say also they will have higher dollar amounts. So you will make more money on an in the money call, even though you'll have a lower return, right? So if I make, um, let's say, Let's give two option examples here, right? Let's say they both make $3 per share in profit, right? Well, if one of them, <clears throat> I paid, I'm gonna screw this example up. If I try to do it off the top of my head. Generally speaking, if you buy in the money, they cost you more. So when the stock moves, your return percent, your ROI is lower as a percentage because you paid more for the option, right? So that's your denominator and your ROI. Uh, formula. So because the denominator is higher, your return number is lower, but you will have made more money, more actual dollars in your account because of the higher delta, right? In the money, options have higher deltas, which means they make more money for every dollar that the stock moves. So the more the stock moves, the more money you will make on in the money strikes. They are safer. They're not as sensitive to um, the stock moving because they have lower gamma, they have higher deltas. So they're not going to... Um, they're going to be safer, right? So I always recommend you buy at the money or a couple strikes in the money to be safest. You will have lower return on investment on those, but you'll have higher dollar returns and they cost more. Out of the money strikes on the flip side are riskier because the stock has to move more in order for you to overcome your um, your break-even price, right? So in the money options will have lower break-even prices. Remember on Micron, we bought the 80 strike with a $3 premium. So our break even price was 83. We might have been able to buy the 75 strike option, which would have been in the money. And that might have cost us, I don't remember what Micron was trading for, but um, it that might have cost us, let's say, $5 for that, or even let's say $7. If that cost us even $7, right, for that contract, well, our break-even price would have been 82, right? So we actually would have gotten to the money faster on an in-the-money strike. Now, it would have cost us a lot more, right? It would have cost us $7 per share instead of $3 per share, but our break-even price is lower. So we actually make money at expiration sooner, <clears throat> or I should say at a closer price, right? Our break-even price is lower on in-the-money strikes than out-of-the-money strikes. So when you buy out of the money, it's tempting because they have really high returns when they work and they cost a lot less up front. But the trade off is they're a lot riskier because it's much less likely that you actually make any money out on an out of the money option. And if you're right and the stock does move <clears throat> quite a bit, well, out of the money options have lower deltas. So you're making less money on your out of the money options because of that lower delta, right? You're getting less. Uh, for example, maybe you're only getting 30 cents per for every dollar that the stock moves, as opposed to an in the money strike where you would have made 70 cents for every dollar that the stock moved. So 
Generally speaking, I don't recommend buying out of the money. There are exceptions to the rules, as always, but just as a rule of thumb, if you are starting off trading options, uh, don't buy out of the money. Buy at the money to a couple strikes in the money. In the money is going to be safest. It's also going to cost you a little bit more, but generally speaking, it's worth it to buy a little bit in the money. When you get a little bit more advanced, there are times and places to buy out of the money, but generally speaking, I don't recommend it for beginners. At the money options, I love at the money options. They're some of my favorites. Um, they strike a nice balance between the two where they're not too expensive, but they're not too unlikely to work. Like they're right at the money. So as you start moving, you just have to overcome your break even price, which is a little bit less than out of the monies because you are closer, um, but they're not quite as close as in the monies, but you're not paying as much. So it's a nice balance between the two, in my opinion. And at the money options have the greatest acceleration because gamma is greatest at the money. But so is theta. So, you know, there's a give and take here. I like at the money options, but uh, for beginners, I certainly recommend trading a little bit more in the money. One or two strikes in the money is usually pretty safe. So then once you've decided, one, that you're bullish on the stock, right? You've done your stock analysis and you uh, you decide this is a stock you want to buy. The next step then is figure out how long you're going to be in the trade, which comes down to essentially a volatility assessment on the stock. Now, some people decide this through average true range. That's a good way to decide. Um, some people, you can use Keltner channels as a good way to decide generally how much the stock moves. Um, you can just kind of eyeball it looking at, okay, well, how long does it take for the stock usually to get from where it is to resistance? All right, well, normally it takes whatever, 10 days to get there. All right, well, double it to be safe. So I'm expecting to be in the trade for 20 days. Okay, fine. And then you buy an option that expires more than 20 days away. So 40, 50, 60 days away, something like that. So you can kind of eyeball it like that, or you can use your ATR, stuff like that. Then once you have decided how long you're going to be in the trade, you have decided on a contract that is longer than that, right? More time than that. Then you pick your strike price. You decide whether you want to trade in the money, at the money, or out of the money. Uh, again, I prefer at the money to in the money. Out of the money is very risky, so definitely I don't recommend that. I recommend in the money to be safest or at the money. It's riskier, but it's uh, it's not too bad. And then we have at the money is basically just medium, medium risk. In the money is safer, out of the money is risky, at the money is just medium. And then all you do is you create and send a buy to open limit order. We always use limit orders. We do not trade with market orders, okay? Unless you are day trading stocks and you need to be in and out really fast. Even then, I still wouldn't day trade with options because your bid ask spreads are going to be wider than they are on stocks. You're going to get worse fills. And because options are much lower priced, every little bit matters on an option because, again, it's going to be multiplied by 100 and all of that. So every one cent on a fill that you get off on an option contract is another dollar that goes down the drain. So we don't want to do that. Always use a limit order with a call option, and you might want to place your limit order for less than it's currently trading, right? So you want to wait for the price to come down and meet your limit price. So that's always a good thing to do. So we can uh, always do a limit order here, but you fill out a buy to open limit order with your broker with all of the details of the option, meaning the expiration date, the stock that you want to trade on it, the strike that you've chosen, all of the details. And then you also include your limit price. And there you go. It's a simple buy to open order. All right, so that's how you buy a call option. Now, keep in mind that the option will disappear after the expiration date. It will no longer exist, which means in order to book a profit with this strategy, you need to sell to close your trade before expiration. If you just sit there and wait through expiration and you were up 600 bucks on your trade and then you are asleep at the wheel on Friday and you wake up Monday morning, that option's just going to be gone. All of your profit that was, it was a paper profit because it was just, it was an open profit. You hadn't closed it yet. You hadn't booked that profit. It just goes poof. It disappears. So in order to book that profit, you need to sell your contract or you need to exercise it before expiration. The more time remaining until expiration, the more time value will be left in your option when you sell. This is one big reason why we always buy more time than we need. Okay, so that's it for the long call option. I'm a little bit running out of time. What time is it? 8.50. I'm much running out of time. So playing defense, we're going to look at the other strategy today. So buying call options is great when a stock is going up, but what if you already own a stock and it's turning against you? 
this is where put options come in. So remember that a put option gives the owner the right to sell shares of the underlying stock. Do I limit sell as well? I sure do. Only limit orders. I would do a market order if I really, really need to get out of the contract and I don't care about a bad fill, but that rarely ever happens. Generally, if I'm trading well, if I'm trading right, I don't desperately need to get out of the trade. So limit to get in, limit to get out. Good question. Okay, so a put option, remember, gives the owner the right to sell shares of the underlying stock. So in effect, a put option acts as insurance against any losses in the stock. Because by buying a put option, you're purchasing a guarantee that you can sell your shares for the strike price. So it's like buying fire insurance on your home, right? You don't hope that your house burns down, but if it does, you're covered financially. If your house never burns down, you don't get your monthly insurance premiums back, right? You're out the premium that you paid. Those are the price that you pay for your safety and security. It's the same thing with options, right? If your stock never burns down, your option is going to expire worthless. You just paid that premium and you just treat it exactly like you do with insurance on your house or your car or something like that, right? So you don't hope that your stock burns down, but if it does, you're covered. This is because your put option goes up in value as the stock goes down. So it counters the losses from your stock by going up in value, just like your insurance contract would. All right, let's look at an example of this on Thinkorswim. We'll jump over. Um, so this also will answer uh, your question earlier about is there a risk graph on think or swim there sure is so if you come to the come on if you come over to the analyze tab the second sub tab here says risk profile this is where the risk graph is so under the analyze tab we have our ad simulated trades and let's just do one on apple so we'll pull up a trade on apple here i actually kind of like apple here so we had as you guys are probably aware market sold off today I'm really not actually sure why, because the Fed said that they were going to increase rates by a quarter percent, and then they came in and they, they increased rates by a quarter of a percent, and the whole market went, oh no, and sold off. And I was just like, why are, why are we freaking out about that? We, we knew they were going to increase rates by a quarter percent. They're going to do it again this year. Like, so I don't know. Everything sold off today. Yeah, it was Yellen talking about the banks. It could have been. I don't know. For some reason, the market didn't like what it heard. So we sold off today. But I think this is a good buying opportunity, especially for a stock like Roku. I'm almost certainly going to pick up a trade on Roku here. Um, I actually, I had a trade on Roku, but I sold everything this morning before the, uh, the Fed announcement because you never know what's going to happen with the Fed announcement. So uh, this is a good opportunity to buy back in. So let's look at a trade on Roku because I like Roku quite a lot here. So looking at a trade on Roku here. As an example, do, 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 do. if we come over to our risk profile here, let's let's just pick up a trade. Let's say that we're actually we're going to pick up shares of Roku. So let's say that we buy shares. We bought them right at the open here for sixty three dollars and eighty eight cents, or even sixty four dollars. So for sixty four dollars per share, right now we're down a little bit on the trade. Right, we're down eighty bucks. Uh, at the current price here. And we've got our risk graph here. So the more Roku goes up, the more money we make, the more it goes down, the more we lose, right? So we've got our, our PL here over on the left. This is our zero line. So as we're above this, we're making money. As we're below this, we're losing money. And we have the stock price here across the X axis. As we go further to the right, we're going up in value. So we make money. As we go further to the left, we're going down, we're losing value. Okay. Okay. So if I was worried about Roku continuing to go down and I wanted to protect my losses. I could buy, for example, the 64 strike put option here. So I bought Roku for $64 per share. I could buy the 64 strike put option. And just to make the math simple, let's say that I could pick this up for $5 per share. And what that means is now I pay $5 per share for the right to sell my shares at 64. So on the stock price here, I bought at 64 and I could sell at 64. So that leaves me net break even on the stock. However, I'm also paying $5 per share for the right to do that. So the most I could lose on this trade then is $5 per share, which is what I paid for my insurance, right? That's my insurance premium. So if I look at my risk graph here, now notice, why are we all curved? Okay, I don't know why this is curved. It should be. <laughs> Should be straight lines here, but it's not. 
Okay, but you can still see the most I could lose here is 500 bucks, right? My risk evens out here uh, at 500 bucks, and that is the most that I can lose on this trade. Whereas as I go above 64 here, well, now I'm still making money, right? Because basically I will have made any money that, that I made on the stock, I'll make the same return minus $5 per share, right? So I'll make $5 per share less on the stock because of this insurance that I paid, but it limited it limits my losses. And actually, if you buy a stock in, you know, if you have 100 shares of a stock and you buy one put option on it, it behaves, there we go, it behaves the same as a call option. So you'll notice this looks like a call option graph, and it basically is. This is like buying the 64 strike call option and paying $5 for it. That's exactly what this risk graph looks like. So if you already own shares, you can buy a put option, limit your risk here, and basically turn it into a call option like structure. Pretty cool stuff, right? Yeah, so the reason it was curving is because these two trades that I closed earlier today, for some reason, that was like making it have this curve, which I don't really understand because these are already closed. My quantity is zero. They don't exist. But it's still, for some reason, affecting my open PL here. So whatever. <laughs> so yeah. Um, anyways, that's why that was looking like this. But now with those unchecked, I have this here. So this is basically what my trade will look like. As we go up in value, I can still make unlimited profits as Roku goes up. And if I'm wrong and Roku goes back down, well, the most I can lose then is what I paid for my insurance. And this is very much a choose your own adventure. I can change how much I want to pay for my insurance and how much uh, protection I get. So if I buy far away, like for example, let's say I buy a 50 strike put here. Well, that's gonna cost me way less, right? This only cost me 93 cents. But my insurance doesn't kick in until the stock is below 50 bucks. So I will lose everything from 64 down to 50. So I'll lose that $14 plus the extra 93 cents. So in total, my risk here is $14.93 per share times 100, basically 1500 bucks here, right? About halfway between 1000 and 2000. So I stand to lose a lot more because I'm giving myself more room for the stock to move down before my insurance kicks in. Then when it kicks in below 50, I cap my losses there, right? And I could actually do this even the opposite way. I bought the stock for 64, but I could actually buy the right to sell those shares at 70. I'm just going to pay a lot more for those, right? So now it costs me $9 per share. So this kicks in a lot sooner. Notice my risk is a lot less. The downside of this is that it eats into my profits. So if I didn't have this and Roku went from 64, let's fix the scale here and kind of zoom in a bit. Uh, if Roku went from 64 up to 70, well, I would make 600 bucks here, right? Because $4 or $6 per share move on 100 shares, right? I'd be right up here at $600 profit. But if I pay $9 for this in the money put here, well, now once the stock gets to 70, I'm still not making money, right? I've made six dollars on my stock but i paid nine dollars for my insurance so i'd still be out three dollars per share right so i actually need the stock to move up more than nine dollars per share to start making money on this trade overall which is my break-even point here which is what 73 so 64 plus the nine dollars that i paid for the option leaves me with a break-even price of 73. so that's the downside of buying in the money protection yes it kicks in way sooner and yes, I can get out for less, right? I can get out for um, actually a $5 profit minus the $9 that I paid in the option here. So I can get out for a lot less, $3.10 here, but it doesn't, uh, or excuse me, $6, right? So $6, I make a $6 profit on the stock, but I lose $9 on the insurance, $9.10. So that leads me to a $3.10 maximum loss here. And if the stock goes down, yeah, I lose a lot less. It's better protection, but I'm paying more for it, which cuts into any gains that I would make on the stock, okay? So, no, it's not an after hours data issue. This is all fine. Date in the risk profile is date of expiration. So there's two different dates here on the thinkorswim uh, expiration. This one down here tells you what day you're looking at on the risk graph. So. Um, if I go to today, this is the value of the day today. As I march this forward, notice that this purple line gets closer and closer to the blue line because the purple line is the value of the trade today. The blue line is the trade at expiration. So as I march time forward, 
as I get closer to my April expiration here, then every day that goes by, this option is losing more and more value due to time decay. So what you're watching here is the effects of time decay. You're watching my option lose time value until expiration day, and suddenly it's all together. This date, however, is what we're looking at here in kind of the gray box here. This is the date for calculating my probabilities. So notice we have these like little percentages here, and this is because of this price slice. So as I move the price slice, notice those percentages change. And it's telling me based on purely based on standard deviation, which is not the end all be all, but it's it's a decent measure. It's giving me the probability based on the standard deviation of the stock of my price being to the left of this or to the right of this. So to the left, I have a 53% chance. To the right, I have a 46% chance. So basically, you know, I have a 46% chance of being above 63.21 by April expiration. So if I were to move this to this week, for example, this Friday, notice my range gets a lot narrower here, right? Now, so this, sorry, I should have explained this. This box here, this little gray box, this is a one standard deviation move of the stock. So one standard deviation for this week, obviously, you know, we're on Wednesday night here, Thursday morning for me, but um, this, you know, there's not much time left before Friday expiration. So there's not much move for the stock to make, right? Sure, we could have a higher than standard deviation move, but a one standard deviation move would be here between 60 and whatever this is, 66, right? So somewhere between these two prices is a one standard deviation move by this date. So I can move this date. Usually you should just set this to your option expiration here. And this tells you what, within one standard deviation, what a normal move for the stock would be between now and then. So it's a good, good thing to kind of look at here. Okay, we're going to end things there because I have to move on to our VIP session. So showed you what those risk graphs look like. So the long stock by itself, again, just looks like a normal long stock graph. But the put option uh, by itself, the put option has limited downside as the stock goes up and it makes money as the stock goes down. So when we combine those, this gets pulled down a little bit down to here and your long stock losing money gets counteracted by your put option making money. So those just kind of flatten out and those become even down here, which gives you basically the same risk profile as a, uh, as a call option, right? So it looks something like this. So yeah, when you combine those, that's what happens. So remember, just like when buying call options, you need to sell or exercise your option before expiration in order to capture any benefit. So if the stock went down, your put option is making money, you need to either sell that put option or exercise it in order to uh, actually have some protection. All right, VIPs, we're going a little bit late, but I'm pretty sure all of you are here with me, so it shouldn't be a problem. So should you sell or should you exercise your option? These are choices you're going to have to make. Generally, you just sell the contract when you don't want to deal with the underlying security. So for example, when you are long a call option and you don't actually want to own the shares, you just want to make money on the stock going up, there's no reason to exercise your option, right? Just sell the contract, bank the profits, and move on. You would exercise your call option when you want to buy the shares, or you would exercise a put option when you want to sell your shares. So if you actually have sell shares and you actually want to sell them when it goes down, then you would exercise your put option, which would you lose the money you paid for the put, but then you're able to sell your shares for a higher price, okay? So exercising a put versus simultaneously selling the put and selling the shares uh, basically leads to the same returns. There's no difference really between exercising an option and, um, and just trading the option, like getting rid of it, closing the trade. You'll make basically the same return in both scenarios. So it's usually just much easier to just trade the contract, just close the contract and call it good. So the vast majority of the time, options are never exercised, which is where you get the statistic where people say that um, most options expire worthless. That's not true. Most options are not exercised before they expire. So most of the time, yeah, they just disappear, but you just don't want to be the one holding the bag, right? That a lot of people use that statistic as a reason why you should sell options instead of buy them. And that is a misrepresentation of that statistic. I don't like it when people say that. I think it's misleading. And when people say that, they have an agenda to get you to sell options. 
which don't get me wrong, I like selling options, but the fact that most options expire and are never exercised before they expire is not a reason to sell options, okay? Um, I think that's it's a misrepresentation of the of the data. What this means is that when we buy options, we just don't want to be holding the bag when the option expires, right? You just have to get rid of it before it expires, which we already talked about. So that shouldn't that shouldn't be anything crazy. So you have the right to exercise the option if you choose. Again, you have the right to buy or sell the underlying share. But most of the time, you're just going to sell the contract and move on to the next trade. All right, that is pretty much it for today. Um, so we learned our first two strategies today, long calls and protective puts. These are both very common strategies for buying options. Uh, and that's why we cover them. So if you trade stocks, definitely buying protective puts is a very, very common thing to do, especially if you're more of a long-term investor, you want to protect your investment. Um, and generally, you know, you don't want to lose more than you pay for your stocks. So you want to um, buy some put options to protect those stocks. I think it's it's a very wise thing to do. I don't do a lot of long-term investing. I don't do a lot of share trading. So I don't do a lot of protective puts, but it's something you guys should be aware of because you know my trade objectives are not necessarily your trade objectives. Long calls I use all the time. Very simple, very powerful trade structure. Um, so these are very common strategies. They're ones that most of us use all the time when we're trading options. So now you guys know them. You are ready to go out and trade some uh, some options. Again, do them in a practice account. Do them in a paper trading account. Learn how they work. Um, get used to buying and selling them, picking your strikes, picking your uh, your expirations and all of that. Get comfortable with it. You'll probably make some mistakes. Do it in a paper trading account. Get comfortable with it. And then, uh, yeah. You guys know what you need to know to buy some options now. Now, I cover a lot more strategies than just these. And we walk you through exactly how to execute and adjust them in the Options Accelerator program, which is a little, not a little, it's a lot more in depth than the boot camp. Um, so if you guys are interested in continuing after the boot camp, the accelerator is the, the next step for you guys. I'm not going to give you a hard sales pitch or anything here today, just give you like a brief overview of what the accelerator is, just so you have it on your radar. Um, some of you will be ready to trade options on your own after boot camp, and that's great. I highly encourage you guys to take what you've learned here and run with it. The whole point of boot camp is to get you ready to trade options. So you are ready to trade options after this. Uh, and tomorrow will be our last day talking about selling options. You'll be ready for that as well. But a lot of you, especially if you're brand new to options trading or you want to learn how to do it maybe the right way, um, you're probably going to want some more handholding and guidance to make sure that you're doing everything the right way, learn how to adjust them, learn how to handle the trade once you got them on. And that's perfectly fine. That's what I created the accelerator for, right? So that's that's the whole purpose that exists. So the boot camp is to get you trading options. And some of you will be ready to go and just trade options on your own. Those of you that are more DIY oriented and just go getters and very self starters, I think that's great. I'm kind of that kind of person too. So I have no problem with that. Those of you that want some more handholding, you want more guidance. Well, I have the accelerator program. So boot camp is like your basic training and the accelerator is just everything else. So it's a 10 week comprehensive apprenticeship style program. Um, it's for beginner and intermediate level option traders. If you're an advanced options trader already, well, first of all, I don't know why you're in boot camp, but second of all, the accelerator is probably not for you. It's for people that have some experience option trading or you're brand new to options trading and you want some more, you know, some more in-depth instruction and more like handholding as we take trades together and that sort of thing. So it's a it's a learn by doing experience. It's less of this like classroom stuff. This is super important. Don't get me wrong. In order to take the accelerator, you have to have gone through boot camp because I need you guys to know what you're doing. So the boot camp is necessary to learn, you know, how options are priced, how we buy options, like all of this stuff you have to know. Um, but with a boot camp, we learn by actually like taking trades in Thinkorswim. We'll take real trades in real accounts. You get to follow along with me, take the same trades I take if you want. We do it in the live market so you get to see. You know, we'll put everything into practice. I'll show you how to do real implementation, all of that. So if you're enjoying boot camp, I mean, just think what it would be like to do this together for 10 weeks, trading options together in the real world. That's basically what the accelerator is. Um, this is from the last accelerator I did. But uh, yeah, I had this trade on Apple like the night before I taught this trade. Uh, I took this put position on Apple, paid $1.15 the night before. And then the next day, it was worth $4.10, so 252% overnight. Not bad. So we show you how we do stuff like that, how I take those trades, how I find them, uh, and then how I handle them. Um, these are a little bit outdated now, but I was doing some longer term cash flow strategies on Moderna and uh, V there. So these were great. 
Um, yeah, and a lot, a lot, a lot more types of trades. So we'll do more advanced stuff like, um, you know, we'll do plenty of iron condors, we'll do credit strategies, we'll do some calendar spreads, all sorts of things like that. We'll do more advanced stuff. I still do very simple just calls and puts as well. I do, um, what are they called? Vertical spreads. Couldn't think of that for a second. So we do all types of trades. So you'll learn how to manage them. But more importantly, you'll you get to actually watch how it's really done. And you get to practice for yourself. You know, you do it in a paper trading account. I do it with my real money. But that's because, you know, I eat my own cooking. <laughs> I believe in what I'm teaching and I show you guys how I do it with my real money. So if you guys want to learn more about that, you can go to tradesmart.university slash accelerator. I'll put the link in chat real quick. But um, again, I'm not going to go into too much detail tonight. If you are interested, you can look it up, but we are going to be closing this real quick and moving to bootcamp. So if you're interested, click that link and you can learn more. But that is pretty much it today. Thank you guys for joining me. We've got another VIP session tonight. So we're about to move on to that. I'm about to start the VIP room. Again, those of you that joined a little bit later, if you are VIP, please check your email. We had a little snafu with Zoom earlier. Um, and so we need to get everyone registered for tonight. So please make sure you're, you check your email if you're VIP. You got an email from Rebecca. She sent it to all the VIP people. Um, there's a link in there that you'll have to click in order to join tonight's VIP session. So if you haven't done that, check your email for a link from Rebecca, and we'll use that for our VIP class tonight. Okay, I'm going to go launch the VIP room. I hope those of you that are not VIP have a fantastic evening, and I will see you all tomorrow. We'll wrap up for our last class of um, selling options. We'll talk about writing option contracts, selling to open. And that'll be the last things that you guys need to know to go ahead and fly the coop and start trading options on your own. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and close down this room and I will see you all in the VIP. Well, I'll see most of you in VIP next.